about 15 minutes into the trading session. That little change, not seeming to be too phased by the CPI print this morning, which came in hotter than estimated. All three major averages, not even down a tenth of 1%, which brings me to Liz Ann Saunders' latest note. She gets to let out. It's called Whole Lot of Love, and it's about sentiment in the market here. Liz Ann Saunders, of course, is the Schwab chief investment strategist. She's with us now. So, Lizanne, when you look at those numbers that we got this morning and look at the reaction or seeming lack of reaction um, in the stock market, what does that tell you about sentiment? And is that sort of in line with what you've been seeing? Well, certainly CPI wasn't in line with what anybody was expecting. I, I, it's always hard to judge what is essentially 20 minutes of a market open. Um, we, we make these assumptions about what the market sort of should do in the face of economic data that comes in either you know hotter or weaker than expected. But there's so many moving forces that uh, that define that. Uh, you know, I think the the CPI uh, thing maybe that the market is looking through is rightly so. There's been a lot of tension on the used car prices piece of it, uh, you know, excluding used cars. And, and maybe that's not an exercise we should ever do. Instead of core being up four and a half percent, it's up 2.7 percent. And uh, I heard in one of the segments before this one about the Mannheim index not so, showing the same increase. So you, you can massage the data a little bit and come up with, uh, you know, a slightly more benign uh, story. But again, you know, the market's got lots of forces driving it. And, uh, I, you know, I'm not surprised in, on any given day what the, what the market does in the short term. You know, Lizanne, something that you surfaced in, in your latest note is um, CEO confidence has really skyrocketed over the last uh, several months. Um, but, you know, as you kind of attach to this note, when confidence is that high, Typically, we don't see these kinds of huge gains from the S&P that follow. I'm curious how you're thinking about this setup against the backdrop of you know, what has been described in the last few months as a, a peak growth environment when you look at you know, likely GDP and ISM and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I, I do think we are facing not peak growth in level terms, but peak growth rate, um, both for the economy and earnings. And that's just simply the, the base effects from second quarter of last year. And I think CEO confidence, which is highly correlated to corporate profitability, is tied to that, given that uh, refinitive expectations has second quarter year over year earnings growth for the S&P now approaching 70%. But the likelihood that that's the peak is there. And I think what when you look back at, at past highs in, in CEO confidence, you could do the same thing with consumer confidence. And then you look at periods where corporate profit growth has been stratospheric, you tend to have weaker uh, corresponding returns for the equity market, largely because the market as a discount mechanism at that point has already priced in a lot of what we are now in the process of seeing in the second quarter. So I think this environment of the market having moved ahead to some degree of the news that we're seeing right now is in keeping with, with patterns historically. A greater extreme in this environment because of the vagaries of, uh, of COVID, but uh, somewhat in keeping with with, with typical patterns. Lizanna, let's stay on your note. I, I like how you talk about the dumb money. How would you define the dumb money and where do you see them invested right now? All right, so I, I always um, make it very clear when I show the chart that I had in that report, which is uh, data real-time uh, gauges from Sentiment Trader, that company, they put it together uh, because I don't want to ever um, have some you know, attachment to me of calling, say, retail investors dumb money, quite the contrary. But what those indexes measure is in the case of what they call the smart money, it's the big commercial hedgers, the big speculators in the index futures market versus the so-called dumb money being more on the odd lot side, um, small lots, speculators in the equity futures, and a number of other factors. And those are real money gauges. They're not, they're not attitudinal survey-based measures of sentiment. Typically at extremes, you want to go against what the so-called dumb money is doing and vice versa in the case of the, of the smart money. But what's been interesting in the past year or so is dumb money positioning has actually been correct. Staying bullishly positioned has been the correct move. More recently, you've seen the smart money 
kind of step up and start to increase long exposure. And you're seeing that in other measures as well. But if you look back, though, to, say, the beginning of 2020, beginning of 2018, in the immediate aftermath of the COVID bear market, those extremes um, did work in favor of where the smart money was positioned and against where the dumb money was positioned. It's just not been um, as as typical in this past year, maybe because of sort of the rise of the newly minted day traders and and the power that retail investors have had and have shown so far anyway as having been accurately positioned on the bullish side. And, and so, listen, when you take sort of the ensemble of all of these various sentiment indicators, um, what what then? <laughs> kind of well, that, what conclusion? Yeah. yeah, what's what's the well, big takeaway? I, I always caveat any discussion about sentiment with, yes, we can find times like now where most sentiment indicators are on the at least toward extreme optimism end of the spectrum. And we know sentiment at extremes is a contrarian indicator. The problem is timing. And sentiment in and of itself doesn't generally mean that the market is imminently going to move in a contrarian fashion. Typically, you you have seen or need some sort of catalyst. And in, in addition to that, breadth, if breadth is relatively healthy, it can be an offset to uh, bullish sentiment conditions. And we learned from the 90s that sentiment can say extremely optimistic for an extended period of time, certainly absent a catalyst. So it's there as a potential risk factor, but it it, do, it doesn't imminently suggest it's a threat to the, uh, the market. Not to mention the fact that a lot of where you're seeing the most egregious speculative excess has been in areas outside the traditional broader averages, be it in crypto or SPACs or non-profitable tech or heavily shorted stocks, the meme stocks, et cetera. So that's not a bad backdrop where the really, really heightened speculation is in these uh, non-traditional kind of hot pockets of the market. Yeah, and a lot of the speculation seems to have come off in those various right. areas that you're talking about. Lizanne, right. it's always good to catch up with you. Lizanne Saunders, Schwab nice Chief Investment Strategist. Thank you. Looking here at shares of both JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, <clears throat> those companies out with their reports earlier this morning. And here to talk a little bit more about Goldman's latest quarter and what the investment banks have on tap is Devin Ryan. He's, a, he's an analyst over at JMP Securities. Devin, always great to have you on the show. So in your note uh, that you wrote to clients following this quarter, um, you, you say that you think the bar has moved higher for Goldman along with the rest of, of their peer group. And I'm curious, you know, it feels like we're seeing that a little bit in, in the stock today. And I'm, I'm just curious how you're thinking about you know, what that hurdle is now for the industry, given such a strong year um, that we've seen really across the business? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, it's been uh, a record first half. And um, with a record environment, I think, um, you know, sentiment for the entire group, you know, financials broadly, you know, cyclical financials, investment banking, asset managers, um, has increased quite a bit. Um, and you've seen really good stock performance. So, uh, with that as kind of your, your base case that we're in a really good environment, I think you know, the question is, what's incremental, what's new news that um, is going to be a catalyst to take the stocks higher? And so today, you know, Goldman had uh, really fantastic earnings, nothing um, uh, to pick at, and they've had a record uh, first half. But um, you know, I think there, there's a little bit of kind of digestion of these great results and then kind of questions around what does the second half look like? Uh, you know, trading is normalizing a little bit. Um, but there's a few things in there that I, I take away that, that keep us you know, very constructive over the intermediate term. And then I think if you have a little bit of a longer term view, um, there's still a lot of upside in the stock because they have so many growth initiatives um, that are you know, really idiosyncratic to Goldman. And I think they're um, making really nice progress um, across a number of fronts. So we're, we're still very bullish here. I get the performance today, um, but you know, great results. Well, Devin, what does the second half look like then for the big banks? Uh, clearly, I mean, trading activity is not going to be what it was in the first quarter. What, is, what does the second half look like? Yeah, so trading will probably normalize, um, maybe even a little bit more from where we've seen it. You know, you had um, what I would argue was um, um, well above average levels of activity through the pandemic. There was so much volatility. Um, there's obviously been um, you know, so much primary capital issuance. Um, and, and at some point, you know, we'll probably see that 
um, come back down to earth here a little bit. And that happened you know, even in, in the second quarter. Um, the good news is for a, a small group of firms, including Goldman Sachs, you know, they are gaining market share um, in businesses like trading. And so even as things normalize, I think we're going to remain at a higher bar than people probably appreciate. So that's one point. The other point is you know, investment banking is um, operating at a record level. And what's a little bit unusual is that there's more visibility into what I think will be um, really a huge back half of this year and even early 2022, because you have record level of M&A announcements. And so that means there's going to be a record level of M&A completions, which um, you get paid typically when the deal um, closes. So there's a lot of revenues coming through on the M&A side. And then on the equity capital market side, um, all the SPACs that were announced in the first quarter, those revenues um, still have to come through because you generate the majority of your fees on SPACs on completion. So um, there's, I think the back half of the year uh, is still going to be very strong um, for Goldman Sachs, for the group. Um, but then again, you look into 2022, the comps become more difficult in some of these traditional capital markets businesses. On the other hand, you have areas like you know, transaction banking, which they um, talked a little bit about on the call that we just got off. And you know, they're seeing you know, really significant momentum there. They doubled their deposits in the quarter in that business. They have 300 clients there. Our view is that you know, the momentum is only going to accelerate because proof of concept has been established and, um, and, and clients obviously like the offering. And so you're seeing a lot of momentum there. You're seeing a lot of momentum in your know, third party uh, private equity capital raising. So they're growing kind of the durable revenues, the, the assets under management, um, which is, you know, a nice fee based business. So the bar um, does move higher there. Um, and then in the consumer business and wealth management, they're going to continue uh, to, to grow those those areas and they're going to reaccelerate. Uh, loan growth here. They kind of slowed things through the pandemic, and, and I think we're set to reaccelerate. So there's a lot of really nice growth drivers. Um, and, and on the other side, I think operating leverage because they're very focused on um, expenses at the same time. Um, I want to uh, pick up on that expenses question, Devin, and ask you about compensation in particular, because Goldman has sort of been trying to hold the line on compensation. Is it going to be able to continue to do that? Is Goldman Sachs what it once was in terms of getting the premium, maybe being able to pay people a little bit less because they had the ability to say, oh, I work at Goldman. Does it still have that cachet? Is that buying them anything at this point? Well, I think at the, at the end of the day, you need to have revenues um, to be able to, um, to pay people. And so um, you know, the first half of this year, revenues were uh, by far a record and um, obviously well above what anyone had modeled coming into the year. And so as a result, um, you know, compensation, um, there's a lot to go around. You know, compensation um, levels in the absolute increased um, nearly 50% uh, year over year. So um, I don't think that there's an issue with, with pay at the moment you know, because revenues are so strong. If you take a step back and think about you know, the bigger picture and the longer term for Goldman Sachs, as they grow some of these um, more bank-like businesses, you know, the digital banking, um, transaction banking, those are areas where the compensation attached will not be as high. And so um, I do think that there's room for kind of operating leverage um, and also ROE expansion as some of these newer growth initiatives uh, you know, continue to, to contribute and, and contribute um, increasingly in the years to come. So that takes time, but over time, I do think that there is um, kind of a structural benefit to compensation as um, mm -hmm. newer areas contribute. Devin, I've only got about a minute left. I'm just curious how you're thinking about um, the SPAC boom in the context of the investment banks that you cover and, and how much that is a part of you know, this deal business that Goldman talked about, the backlog that you know, really sets up for a strong second half of 21. Yeah, it's a uh, big driver. Um, you know, there was a record amount. 2020 was the record SPAC year, and then you had more SPACs announced uh, IPO in the first quarter than you did all of 2020. So a lot of those SPACs are now um, working through their process and, and moving uh, either towards announcing a deal or completing a deal. And as I mentioned before, um, the majority of revenues from SPACs come in on the completion of the deal. So there's a lot of revenue still to come through in the back half of this year, which is unusual um, because you typically don't have that much visibility into um, investment banking revenues. m and is a longer tail, but SPACs is providing um, a lot of visibility. It will make a tougher comp into next year because our view is you know, the level of new SPAC issuance 
um, will decline. But um, you know, the capital markets are incredibly active right now. There's a strong appetite to go public. I think SPACs are a, a very viable vehicle to do that. And you know, if SPAC issuance does slow, then you may see you know the, the traditional IPO um, uh, vehicle increase because I think that's really the, the driver here. That there's a lot of companies that are at a level where um, they're ready to go public and they want to go public. And so that's that's really you know, the biggest catalyst behind this. So it will create a little bit of a tougher comp, but we expect investment banking to remain very strong over the next uh, 12 months here. All right. Devin Ryan, analyst with JMP Securities. Devin, always appreciate the time on this earnings morning. I know we'll be in touch. Yeah, great to see you. Well, the Phoenix Suns and Milwaukee Bucks tip off for game four of the NBA Finals tomorrow with the Suns holding a 2-1 lead. It's been a bit of a different look for the NBA this year in the finals. You've got Phoenix, a team that hasn't won a championship. Milwaukee hasn't won one in 50 years. And there's just one player, one player on either team that has any previous experience playing in the finals. So talk more about that and much more on the state of the league. Let's bring in Mark Tatum, the NBA deputy commissioner, as well as the chief operating officer. And Mark, it's great to talk to you today. I will tell you, as Brian and I have experienced heartbreakers for me in LA, Brian in Brooklyn, we sort of look at the finals and say, look, uh, you know, this is a bit of a different look, but you've seen a big bump in ratings, up nearly 40% from last year, on the back of what has been a very challenging season. Give me a sense of how you're looking at the state of the league right now as we go into game four tomorrow. Oh, th thank you so much, Akiko and Brian, for having me. I would say the state of the league right now is great. We have two fantastic teams that are competing hard in the in the finals, and we've got, as you mentioned, some new faces in the finals. Two-time MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo is looking to crown the, the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, bring them home a championship uh, for the first time in 50 years, and then the story of, of Phoenix. And Chris Paul, an 11-time All-Star veteran, the president of the Players Association, trying to win his very first championship and bring a first championship to the Phoenix Sun. So the competition has been terrific. Hey, Mark, Brian here. And I guess one question naturally is, what is the international community kind of uh, play in, in, in the ratings that we've seen with the NBA Finals? Because obviously Giannis is huge for the Greek market and the European market at large, but also just the NBA's aggressive expansion in, around the world in terms of getting streaming rights out there, trying to do better recruiting, just getting the product out into countries that maybe aren't as exposed to basketball. Obviously, the pandemic has made it difficult to physically travel and bring some of those games to other countries. But uh, what have you seen on that front over the 2020-2021 season in international eyeballs on that's a big part of it, Brian. You know, these games are broadcast in 215 countries and 59 different languages around the world. There are more than 100 players who play in the, in the NBA right now who are born outside the United States and seven international players who are participating in these here finals, including Giannis Antetokounmpo, DeAndre Ayton, who is from the Bahamas, but also has family from Nigeria. Um, Devin Booker, whose grandfather is um, is Mexican of Mexican descent, and so he's resonating very much in the uh, the, the Latam community. Um, and it, we're fortunate that these games get distributed all over the world, and people are watching it all over the world. Um, but the, again, it's driven by the competition, as you said earlier in the program. Our ratings are are showing that we're seeing double digit digit increases. We just got the results back from Game Three. Um, Sunday night, that was a 51% versus last year's game three. Um, and as a Kiko, as you said, nearly 40% up through the first three games. So it's clearly resonating with our fans. Mark, there's no question it's been a challenging season for you. You could argue there's been some positives as well as negatives. The positives obviously being you've got more eyes on the game. Uh, you've had a lot of challenges from COVID, but also the injury, especially to star players. You've had players like LeBron James come out and say this is partly because the offseason off season was so short. As you think about that and the success, for example, of the play-in tournament, how do you take the lessons learned from what was such a challenging year into next year to try and keep this momentum going? It's been an extraordinary effort by our players, by our teams to get this season up and running and, and to get to this point, quite frankly. And um, there were a lot of sacrifices that were made by the players and, and we worked very closely in partnership with the Players Association 
our first priority was making sure that people could stay healthy and could stay safe. Uh, we did start the season in December uh, and try to, uh, uh, we actually reduced the normal season from an 82 game schedule to a 72 game schedule. And one of the things that the players said was important to them is that they wanted to get back on track and that they wanted to have that month of August off so they could spend time with their families. You know, a lot of the players who have kids, um, they missed the summer uh, last summer because we were in the bubble uh, for a good portion of the, the season, the, the playoffs to finish up our season. And so that was important. So we had to work within that to try to get the schedule. And again, incredible cooperation and partnership with the Players Association to come to that agreement on the schedule for this season um, and to get to this point where we're actually going to you know, crown a champion here, hopefully in the next week or so. And Mark, uh, obviously the abbreviated season, you just touched on that, but another unique feature of the 2020-2021 season was the play-in tournament for the playoffs, the eight through 10 seeds kind of scrambling with one another through single game uh, uh, play-ins in some cases to get that playoff spot. It's a little bit controversial. Some players saying they, they didn't understand why they needed that. Uh, I guess what was the feedback that you got from the play-in tournament? Is that a feature that you would expect uh, to remain a part of the playoffs in coming years? The feedback has been terrific uh, from our, uh, generally from the players. So that had to be agreed to by the Players Association. And we've been in discussions with them again about continuing that for next season. Um, our teams loved it and our fans loved it. So what we saw as a result of the playing tournament was increased ratings for those games, increased competitive competitiveness at the end of the season. Um, and so, you know, we were very pleased with it. Our players and the Players Association, uh, I think they were very happy with the results. And it, it really brought in more teams and more opportunities right to the very end to participate in our playoffs. And I think that's what generated so much fan interest from that concept of this play in tournament. Uh, Mark, I know you've been instrumental in the league's efforts to internationalize the game. Uh, we were just talking to Dikembe Mutombo last month, talking about the launch of the Africa League. Uh, but things are still a big question mark over in Asia, especially on the back of what happened in China back in 2019. Where does that business stand for you right now? Yeah, we are. We're doing very well in Asia. Um, in China, our games are broadcast in on, on Tencent Digital and um, games are broadly and widely available there uh, throughout the Philippines. Uh, again, very, very popular. We're the number one sport in the Philippines and we're continuing to see viewership and interest at all time highs there. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Akiko, in Africa, uh, just finished up the first season of the Basketball Africa League, our initial launch of a new league uh, on the continent of Africa um, that had an Egyptian team win the, win the Basketball Africa League Championship. So um, our business around the world continues to grow, which fuels talent from all those parts of the world into our league, which makes the league that much more attractive uh, to our fans on a global basis. Well, and I guess that kind of segues nicely into this other point, but we have to acknowledge that USA Basketball did just lose in one of their exhibition games to Australia. They've lost both their exhibition games, and this is for a powerhouse program that a lot of people thought was the premier uh, home for basketball around the world. I guess, what does it tell you about other teams around the world who have NBA caliber stars now and where talent is kind of shifting around the world? It's not just, you know, uh, in the United States anymore. Yeah, the, 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 the talent really has been democratized. So Giannis Antetokounmpo from Greece and by way of Nigeria, two-time MVP, and um, uh, uh, Jokic is the, the reigning MVP. So these international players now are not just playing in the NBA. They are MVPs of this league, most improved players, defensive players of the year, right? Rudy Gobert from France. And so uh, they are having a major impact on the quality of the competition, on the, on the quality of play in our league. And we think it's a fantastic thing. The, the world is getting better um, and, they're get, and they're getting better. And I think that makes basketball a much more attractive game for the world to follow. So we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy that, to see that level of competition continue to grow and grow. All right, Mark Tatum, NBA Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer. Thanks so much for stopping by Yahoo Finance this afternoon.
Welcome to A Time for Change. I'm Sibyl Marcellus here with Alexis Christophorus. The Tokyo Olympic Games are happening next week, just a year after they were postponed because of the pandemic. Athletes are competing in 33 sports, including fencing. And that's where we begin today. That's right. Our first guest is a two-time Olympian, soon to be three-time, who will be representing the U.S. in fencing. Daryl Homer won a silver medal in the 2016 Rio Games, the first fencer to do that in 117 years. And in a sport that has a reputation for being white and wealthy, Daryl Homer is neither. Born in the Virgin Islands, who grew up in the Bronx with a single mom who supported his dream to enter the sport of fencing. And we are delighted to have Daryl here with us today. Hi, Daryl. Uh, good to have you here. I know it is the countdown uh, to your third Olympic Games. Tell us what you're feeling right now, especially after having to wait another year to do this because of the pandemic. And, and what's it going to be like being there with no fans in the stands this time? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I am actually in L.A. I just finished a session and I'm going back into a session after um, I'm done this interview. Um, but I mean, we're all very, very excited going into this Olympic Games. Um, it's been a year delayed. It was a tough year, um, but we are just very happy to kind of be going towards the games. And, um, you know, it's going to be a very, very different experience given that no fans and given that the COVID restrictions um, and we won't be able to move around the city. But uh, we're all very, very excited for this games and I'm um, looking forward to trying to achieve on a high level. Well, Daryl, what are the pandemic safety requirements like in Japan right now? When you're mm. not competing, do you have to still wear a mask? Do you have to social distance? And what about when you're in the arena? Yeah, so I mean, we are still getting kind of details on that, but we know we won't be able to, normally the Olympics is an experience where you kind of explore the city and you you enjoy the culture. This is gonna be kind of a bubble type situation, COVID testing every day, um, no fans, obviously. Um, they're asking us to wear our mask in the village as well. Um, so, I mean, we, we're gonna figure out a lot on the ground. I'm actually one of the earlier events. So it'll be very interesting to kind of, be a, I'll be testing everything as it happens pretty much. But um, I think the main things we're focused on is just what we can control. And um, that's just how we can perform and kind of weather through all these storms. That's pretty smart and, a, and a, a said like a veteran, uh, concentrate on the things that you can control. Hey, Daryl, I want to talk about when it all started for you. you. You got an interest in fencing at a young age, you were around 10 or 11 years old. And at the time, there weren't a lot of people who looked like you in the sport. In fact, fast forward to today, and there are a few black people in fencing at the professional level. Why do you think that is? And what are some of the barriers to entry for people? Yeah, you know, so I actually want to um, kind of shine a light on uh, th there are many more black fencers than people give credit to. I think that that's like a, a stereotype and that's a misunderstanding. Um, the sport historically has been inaccessible, but specifically where I am in New York City, the Peter Westbrook Foundation has done an incredible job um, from 2000, really. They've had the Olympians on the team, primar primarily from the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, Newark, New Jersey, um, you know, from the inner city. Um, and Peter Westbrook, that was really his vision. He was the person who won the medal, he won a bronze medal in 1984 in the same discipline I did, men's saber. Um, and it's created a program that's really changed the global complexion of the sport. So all praise you to Peter, but um, you know, I actually grew up not seeing many black fencers. I saw Keith Smart preparing for the 04 games. I saw um, Aki Spencerell preparing for the 2000 Olympic games, Aaron Smart and Keith Smart winning medals in the 2008 games. So in a way we have this fraternity or sorority that really is um, just a, a legacy that is being passed down. And, uh, you know, around the world, the program's known and our success is known, and we're just hoping to achieve the same thing going into Tokyo. Olympic Games can mean big sponsorship dollars. Is that true yes. for fencing, Daryl? Yeah, you know, I, I'm blessed. I'm one of the, um, the, the few, I mean, the Olympic Games means big sponsorship dollars for very few athletes, first of all, is really where we should start. Um, but in fencing, I, I work with Toyota. I work with Ralph Lauren uh, quite deeply. I also work with Lululemon. Um, I've worked with Nike in the past, Dick's Sporting Goods. So I've, I've actually been on the, the the more positive side of the sponsorships, and I'm blessed for that. Um, so shout out to Toyota, obviously, Team USA, and uh, shout out to Ralph Lauren as well. Um, you know, really excited to kind of make you guys proud in Tokyo. Those are awesome sponsorship deals, Daryl. And I'm wondering what <clears throat> what your plan is in terms of 
of dealing with your finances. I mean, there's enough to deal with uh, there, you know, with, within your sport and trying to, I know, go for the, go for a medal this time around again. But when it comes to your money and to investing the money from these endorsement and sponsorship deals, um, do you have a philosophy there? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm lucky. I have very, very good family friends who advise me. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm someone who looks at uh, consistent long-term growth. So, um, you know, I'm invested in value stocks over time, um, you know, growth funds, um, you know, RQTF was something I looked at. Um, obviously, that's taken a little bit of a hitting uh, in the past kind of six months, but um, Barron Funds is always something great for me as well. Um, so I just try to look at things that are valuable over time and that can help me grow, have growth over time. I'm not really a, a fast, quick, easy guy. <laughs> and you obviously like to give back. So tell us about your involvement with the Fencing in the Schools program. How does fencing help kids from impoverished backgrounds? Yeah, I mean, you know, so I, right now, I mean, the main uh, the main nonprofit that I'm partnering with is the Peter Westman Foundation. I still represent them as my primary fencing club. Um, and, you know, like I said, Peter has done an amazing job of taking kids like me from the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, um, and just empowering us and giving us kind of a strong background in education and personal character development and also in the sport. So I'm beyond grateful for all the work um, that we're doing. You know, I've gone from being a kid in the program, uh, looking up to Olympians to being the Olympian that kids look up to. So um, it's very, it's a very deep experience. It's a very powerful experience. And um, I think it's something that I wish uh, more people did and took part in. Absolutely. Mentorship is, is such a powerful thing, Daryl. You are looking at your third Olympic Games in less than two weeks. What are some of your personal goals for these games? And do you think there might be a fourth Olympic Games in your future? Yeah, you know, I think one of the, the only positive thing about this game being delayed a year is that the next game is in three years, right? So it gives you a shorter... Uh, <laughs> gives you a shorter runway into the next one. But, um, you know, as I look to my third game, I just kind of want to take the culmination of all the experiences that I had in the first two um, and the, over the five last five years, really, and the growth I've had as a person and kind of bring that onto the strip and see how I can perform. You know, obviously, I want to medal at the last games, and that's the goal deep, deep inside of me. But, you know, as an athlete, we all know that to perform on a high level, you have to free yourself and allow yourself to kind of not give into the pressure. So um, right now, it's really, really, really just me going into training, everyday focus, relaxing a lot outside of that, and just gathering my mind, my emotions, my thoughts, um, and my physical ability in one and hoping for a great day. And Errol, you've written about how there's no other place where you've been able to challenge yourself as much as in sports and in fencing. But what about yeah. the workplace? How does it apply yeah. there? You know, so I um I worked for uh, three years when I graduated from college. I started the day after <laughs> I graduated um, in advertising at a big agency in New York City called Anomaly. Um, great, great, great time. I think that taught me a lot about preparation. Um, you know, I think as athletes, many times we're used to systems being created for us to succeed. Um, but it was different being in a workplace where you're kind of anonymous and you have to kind of contribute to a team, right? Um, so I thought that that experience really taught me the value of teamwork and how to work better with my teammates within fencing. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, I think that, yeah, I, I think the Olympics is a whole, um, it really breeds a character in you that can be beneficial in any environment. Um, we're pushing ourselves to the highest level every single day. Um, and the work we do is from our hearts, you know, um, we're doing this to push ourselves. So um, I think that that's beneficial in every workplace. For sure. And from what I'm hearing, you're not ruling out participating in the 2024 games, huh, Daryl? Definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, I think the fencing venue will be the Grand Palais. So uh, how do you turn that down? <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are excited to see you compete at the highest level representing the U.S. in just about a week and a half there in Tokyo. Daryl Homer, Olympic fencer, best of luck to you. Thanks so much for making time for us. No, thank you for having me today um, and thank you for the good luck. If you're looking to buy some furniture for your patio or deck, get ready to wait a while. Manufacturers are having a tough time keeping up with demand, and that is causing a patio furniture shortage. Here to talk about it is Eric Muller. He is the CEO of Watson's, one of the country's largest home recreation retailers. Eric, it's good to have you here. So tell us, what, what are the state of things right now? Are those supply bottlenecks starting to ease a little bit? 
I, would, I wouldn't say we're seeing those uh, supply bottlenecks ease yet. We're still seeing some stress um, in the supply chain for sure throughout Asia, some domestic uh, supply chain stress and uh, freight continues to be an issue. So, you know, not, not just the, uh, the, the time to get the goods produced, but the actual time to get the goods uh, from Asia over, over the uh, water into our ports and there continues to be uh, holdups at the ports as well. So what, what's a, if there is such a thing as a typical wait time, how long might somebody be waiting for a, a, their patio furniture or a fire pit for the backyard? Sure. So, you know, I would say typical pre-COVID wait times, um, depending on, you know, where you were sourcing those goods, um, special order, domestic special order goods, six to eight weeks would be normal today. I'd say you're looking at, um, you know, 16 weeks on average, probably stretching out to 20 weeks from some domestic suppliers. And um, being that it's a seasonal business, you know, a lot of the inventory is brought in pre-season. So it starts to leave Asia um, December, January, and the stores start to stock, uh, stock it up throughout the first quarter of the year. Um, this year, that, that was obviously a big challenge. We weren't seeing, uh, we still have goods that we ordered almost a year ago that, are, uh, that aren't here yet. So, um, you, you know, there, there's inventory around, there's, there's inventory in some of the stores around the country. And, uh, you know, I'd say about 20% of normal levels. So if you're lucky enough to find, uh, find some inventory, it's there and you don't have to wait too long. But typically you're waiting uh, for those, those next shipments to arrive uh, either domestically or from, from overseas. I'm curious if customers who are told they'll have to wait 20 plus weeks for that deck or patio furniture, if they're just saying, you know what, I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to place that order right now. Are you seeing people doing that or are they saying, no, OK, I, I, I'm willing to wait? Yeah. So, you know, the consumers um, are pretty resilient throughout this uh, throughout this covid uh, environment. You know, I've been doing this almost 30 years and typically uh, all of us as consumers, we want instant gratification, but they seem to be much more patient. So I think they're aware that uh, the playing field's the same everywhere. And if you, if you want uh, furniture, indoor furniture, outdoor furniture, you know, the lead times are kind of what they are. So I would say the consumers are willing to wait um, in most cases. Uh, you know, this morning we got a report about um, prices going up and inflation running hot on, on everything from cars and clothing to, to food and gasoline. What is it like in your industry? Are, are material costs rising and are you having to pass any of that along to the consumer yet? Yeah, we, we, we for sure are seeing uh, inflationary prices, particularly in uh, raw materials, but also the freight is a, ma is a massive challenge right now. So you know, the time it's taking us to get goods from overseas here uh, is a big challenge, but the, the cost to get the goods here um, is a big challenge. So, you know, historically, if, if, uh, if a container, a 40 foot container cost us 4000 or $5,000 to get door to door from Asia, um, you know, it's, it's slowly gone from 8000 to 12000 to 15000 and in some cases up to $20,000 to get one single container here. So, the freight's a major, um, ha having a major impact on cost, and uh, we're trying to absorb, you know, as much of that as we can for our consumers. As far as just the cost of goods, yeah, we're continuing to see some inflationary um, pressures on the cost of goods as well. You know, it depends on the industry, but in patio furniture in particular, you know, 10%, 12%, 15% range, I would say, would be pretty normal, what we've seen over the last uh, four to six months. Eric, in addition to those inflationary pressures, we keep hearing about companies having a tough time finding workers. Are you experiencing any kind of a, a labor shortage or labor challenges in your industry right now? Labor is definitely a challenge. Um, you know, every everybody I speak to um, in every industry is having that same challenge. I think that some of the government policies through COVID, as, as we're all aware, have made it uh, difficult to hire, to hire um, folks at the moment. And as those uh, programs wear out, we're seeing an uptick in some of the cities uh, where those programs are wearing out and the amount of applications coming in. But I think that uh, labor is definitely a challenge right now.
And in terms of uh, what is in demand at the moment, I know I had done a story um, a couple months ago on fire pits. They just you couldn't get your hands on a fire pit. Everybody wanted to gather outside because of COVID. And so sales of fire pits were really the hot thing. Um, what about right now? What what items are you seeing, um, you know, really selling like hotcakes? Fire pits continue. So, you know, just to step back for a moment, since COVID, uh, the, the overall demand for all home recreational products has been very strong and continues to be very strong. Um, but in particular, in, in the outdoor living space, fire pits are extremely strong. Uh, everybody, you know, is, is interested in getting their hands on one of those wicker sectionals, outdoor sofas, uh, dining sets. Um, all of the above. I would say across the board, there's there's a tremendous demand for, for anything outdoor living. And the demand um, continues to be strong, you know, even a year, uh, a year after the start of this whole COVID situation, the demand continues to be strong throughout the summer. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I, I was just wondering, you know, if you're starting to see any of that demand pull back a little bit. I mean, now that things are opening up more the vaccinations are ramping up. Perhaps people are getting together more indoors. Are you seeing any signs that this torrid pace of demand is going to start to slow down? You know, it's the question that I get every week, five times a week. Um, and if I had a crystal ball, I could give you a great answer. But our experience, uh, and we're fairly, you know, we have a, our geographically, we're mostly Midwest, um, but we have we have a wholesale business. So we do have, um, you know, some, some, national, uh, somewhat of a national footprint, or uh, we can get a national feel. I would say that um, demand, when, when, we, when we reopened in mid-May, that first 45 days, the, the year-over-year comps were uh, down quite a bit um, compared to 20. And in the last three or four weeks, those comps are now back up again over 20. So, you know, the initial month we were uh, reopened last year, I think there was just so much demand that, uh, that we saw a little bit of a retreat. But since then, we've seen, uh, we've seen same store comps uh, increase over 2020 for the last three or four weeks. So I, overall, I would say demand continues to be very strong. It's a good problem to have. Watson CEO, Eric Muller, thanks so much for being with us. I think the big takeaway is be patient if you've ordered some furniture for inside or outside your home. Today, Subway officially launched its menu revamp dubbed Eat Refresh Refresh at all U.S. locations. It is the largest menu update in its more than 50-year history. Joining us now is Subway CEO John Chidsey uh, alongside Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma. Uh, it is good to have you with us, John. Thanks for being here on a big day for, for Subway. So this menu update is pretty extensive. It includes more than 20 updates, including nearly a dozen new ingredients, six new sandwiches. Why the big overhaul here all at once? And, and what is the message you're trying to send to customers? Yes. Um, well, when our team joined uh, recently, uh, in the, I'll say in the last 18 months or so, one, obviously one of the first things we did is we went out and did a lot of consumer research, talked to a lot of our franchisees about you know what they liked about the brand, what they wanted to see that they hadn't seen. And one of the Biggest uh, revelations, I would say, is that there hadn't been a lot of food innovation in the brand over the past five or six years. And guests, consumers told us that they were looking for more craveable food. Franchisees told us the same thing. So we got really busy to work over the last you know, 14, 15 months um, and looked at our core and figured out which items we really thought we needed to upgrade. So whether it was the turkey, whether it was the ham, the rotisserie chicken, the steak, new bread, uh, the smashed avocado, you know, we really wanted to upgrade that course. So we're trying to send a message to our consumers that we hear you. Uh, I think in the QSR space, you know, you always need to refresh to stay fresh. It's a very innovative industry, as you know, fast moving. And so we just really needed to up our game. So I hope this signals to both our franchisees and our consumers, we heard you. And I think you'll be very impressed with the upgrade and the quality and give you lots of reasons to come back and try us again. So, John, as I was saying, you're putting a lot of firepower behind this, including an ad in the heart of Times Square, as well as a star studded lineup with Stefan Curry, Serena Williams. You've also been facing a lot of growing competition in the fast food industry. What's at stake here for Subway? Sorry, what was the last piece? What, what for Subway? What's really at stake here for Subway? Oh. What do you hope to raise awareness for? Well, again, as, as I said, we're, we're the largest restaurant chain in the world. We're the largest restaurant chain in the United States by, by units. 
So we're ubiquitous. 92% of Americans live within a five mile radius of a subway. So while we have competition out there, they're all considerably smaller. Subway is really America's sandwich uh, brand. And so again, what we're trying to demonstrate through the largest product uh, launch or revamp, if you will, and the largest ad campaign we've ever put behind this is to just assure our consumers that there's a lot of great things at Subway. We wanna show them we're still in the game. And while we've had a tremendous first six months of the year, I like to look at this as just throwing gas on a fire um, in terms of continuing to drive excitement and innovation around the brand. John, I want to ask you about higher prices. We, we found out today consumer prices shot up in the month of June. We're paying more for everything from gasoline to food. Are you seeing higher costs in your business at Subway? And, and are you uh, going to be passing any of those costs along to the consumer? Yes, great question. Um, when we started Refresh, again, given the, a brand of our size, we've been working on this for quite a while. It's not something you do overnight. We had engineered a lot of things to keep it cost neutral, whether it was looking at packaging or other opportunities to offset that. But as we came out of COVID and saw these inflationary pressures, those are obviously new costs that have really nothing to do with the upgrade of all of our core products. So, you know, I think the real question that I heard you talking about on your earlier segment is, is this really a permanent thing or, or is it more, you know, a transitory thing? And I think only Tom will determine, but obviously like all other QSR chains, there's definitely pressure in the system out there. And if it is to persist, obviously some of that is going to get passed on to the consumer if it if it does linger. John, one menu item that is in fact staying is your tuna. Now recently, as you know, the New York Times found that there was no amplifiable tuna DNA in a sandwich that they tested. I spoke to Trevor Haynes, or North America uh, subway president, and he said that it doesn't need to be touched and there's nothing to hide. So John, I want to pose a similar question. Is your tuna real tuna? I'm very glad you asked that question. Yes, it's 100% real tuna. Uh, we're very proud of our tuna. Obviously, as I said, the refresh has been going on for 15, 16 months. We, as I said, we touched turkey, we touched ham, we touched chicken, we touched steak. The one thing we did not touch was our tuna. We're, we're very proud of our tuna. You know, I just say follow the science. Um, once tuna is cooked, its DNA becomes denatured. I think the New York Times even said that, that once you test it, once it's cooked and you test it, you can't prove one way or the other, given just the nature of the test. If you actually go to subwaytunafacts.com, there's all the science in the world on that website. And I think um, it makes the, the case perfectly clear uh, that it is tuned. And again, as I said, we're very proud of our tuna. <laughs> All right. There you have it. The definitive answer. It really is tuna, folks. You heard it from Subway CEO. Hey, John, I, I wanna, it's a twofold question for you. Labor shortages. We, we keep hearing in the restaurant industry in particular, uh, companies are having a hard time finding workers. Is that the case for you right now? And also want to talk to you about your your retail footprint. I know it's been shrinking over the past few years. You ended last year with more than 22,000 stores. Is there a plan to reduce the footprint any further? Yeah, so you know, labor is tough, not just in the quick service restaurant industry, but as you as you all know, in, in in many different industries, and we're certainly not immune to those pressures. You know, one one slight advantage we have is our restaurant footprint um, is obviously smaller than you would find in a traditional McDonald's or Burger King, and therefore we require less workers. But even having said that, yes, there's pressure out there. One of one of the good things that happened though is because of our refresh launch, we knew that we were going to have a lot of demand um, coming into the summer and through the fall with this relaunch. So we got active a little bit earlier in May. We put an ad on our on our digital app, pushing hard for employment, and looked at over actually not looked at received over forty thousand applications. So we've really tried to get the message out there three or four months ahead of time, not even realizing quite the crunch we were going to have. So we were a bit fortuitous in our timing on that piece, and that certainly helped helped a bit. Um, as for your restaurant count question. You know, yes, we're trying to really pivot the brand from being a development organization to more of a guest experience kind of organization. So we're not maniacally focused just on restaurant count. Internationally, there's a huge restaurant count opportunity, restaurant growth opportunity for this brand. Even though we have 17,000 restaurants outside the U.S., we still have tons of room to grow. In the U.S., again, we're much more focused on growing system sales than we are growing unit count. So you know, you, you might see it drift down another 500 or 1,000. Um, having said that, there's still even areas in the U.S. that can grow. But from a system sales standpoint, I think we have lots of growth opportunity. And John, in 30 seconds or less, Subway is really known for being in hubs like airports and trains. What sort of foot traffic are you seeing at those locations? Is there a bounce back? 
Yes, just very quickly, uh, 100% of our system, even with that bottom quartile that you're seeing in downtown locations and you know colleges and some of those areas was positive, not just against 20, but against 19. So yes, that bottom quartile is struggling more than the top three quarters, but even that bottom quartile has started to come back and you see it month by month and improves gradually. So I'm confident by the fall, even that bottom quartile will be you know, in, in a much better light. But overall, the system's done remarkably well for the last six months. All right, John Shitsey, uh, CEO of Subway. Thanks uh, for making time for us today and best of luck with the menu revamp. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.